order. Alderman Hanna, would you please take the roll? Born here. Bow here. Serta. I don't know. Excused. Gesher here. Hyman here. Kittleson. Excused. Clionis here. Manny here. Meyer here. Montemarillo here. Rinfleisch. Ryan. Vanderweel. Here. Verhassen. Excused. Longerman. Here. And Hannah is here. Quorum is present. Moving on to item number three, and that will be an update on our new police station by Mr. John Sabinash of Zimmerman Architect Studios Incorporated. Mr. Sabinash, could you come up and give us our update? Thank you. It feels like a long time, but then again, it, it hasn't been. We've been meeting regularly and have been working toward uh, reconciling the design of the project. We expect to be uh, going out to bid July 8th. We expect to be receiving bids on August 2nd. Uh, we are optimistic. Uh, we've got a project out for bid currently, and there are 14 bidders and 12 have pre-qualified in a, a smaller magnitude project, but nonetheless... It looks like there's a lot of bid interest in projects. So again, we're, we're cautiously optimistic. Uh, there were two significant issues and then one peripheral, one we'll, we'll deal with later, which is cost. But there were two issues that were uh, uh, part of the discussion today. Uh, one is the nature of the soil conditions on the site, and the second was uh, methane and how it might impact the design of the building. And fortunately or unfortunately, I have experience with both products and designed buildings that have been around for a long time now, so I can adequately address the nature of those from a design perspective. The first being, I guess we'll deal with the soil conditions. Uh, one is that the materials we're dealing with in the, the soil strata that are defined out there are natural materials. There's nothing here that is is at all, nothing came down from Mars. This is all existing, generally organic materials. Uh, organic materials have resided under buildings for a long time, and there are methodologies to deal with the design of them in localized conditions like we have here. Um, the strategy that we've used, because it seems to be most cost effective, uh, effectively in an order of a magnitude of half, is to use what's called a geopier. A geopier is effectively a stone column. What happens is the manufacturing company. When I say GeoPiers, it's like Kleenex or Xerox. There are other manufacturers of systems like this, so we're not being proprietary. It'll be competitively acquired. Uh, but what they effectively do is come in and drill a hole and then place stone, either through a vigorous process of, of uh, compaction or in a more settled approach, depending on the methodology that they use, to create a series of stone columns that help to stabilize the soil that are soil products that are adjacent. So it's a, it's a product that's been around a long time, now over 10 years. I have a project uh, that uh, uh, for the city of Brookville that was built a foot above the floodplain on the Fox River that had geopiers, micropiles, and the like. And the building is held up quite well with extraordinary loads. That's a DPW building. So the floor loads and, and clear span structures that we're dealing with there are substantially higher than what we're dealing with on this site. And that building project has held up quite well. So from a soils perspective, there's nothing out there that we haven't managed effectively in the past. And we would look to manage it effectively in the future. In terms of methane, again, that's a natural product. It occurs. It moves vertically and horizontally. So Nobody really can tell you exactly where the methane would be coming. It could be coming from the north. It could be coming directly underneath. It could be coming from the west, east, or south. Um, the prudent thing to do in compare a question that came up was, well, could you dig up all the soils and would the methane go away? The answer is no, because you don't know where it's coming from. Methane that exists in soil strata, again, because there's no determined movement pattern, it would be prudent to have a methane collection system associated with that. And uh, we did a project, actually two projects, both police department projects, but the one that's the best comparison is uh, City of Wauwatosa 10 years ago has a methane collection system. Uh, if managed effectively, again, it's not a, a system that should be inordinately difficult to maintain. It's actually a fairly simple passive system. Uh, it uses simple products, uh, and it effectively removes the hazard that could exist in a building where we know that uh, organic methane type systems are, are effectively managed and, and can facilitate the useful life of the building. So again, that's, that's a, I hate to say simple, but it's a fairly passive system. It doesn't require somebody to be standing there watching a board with lights. 
Uh, it's effectively used in public safety buildings previously and for over a decade, and it can work effectively in the condition that we have here. Uh, the second piece is cost, and costs are related to both of these topics. We are pursuing alternatives to the GeoPair design that might be more cost effective. We're still studying those options, but if those possibilities exist, then we'll get hard numbers and bring those numbers back to the council for consideration. We haven't given up on that or said that this is the best approach or least, uh, uh, least costly approach. There might be more effective ones yet. The cost estimate that we did was a median estimate. Um, so we are, we are looking forward to having a number of competitive bidders that put together competitive prices to come below that estimate against a median estimate. Um, and we still have a full construction contingency remaining within the budget. So again, um, we, we've uh, bitten into the design contingency to facilitate some of the methane collection and soil conditions that we've encountered, but uh, that's what design contingency is there for. Uh, we still are maintaining a full construction contingency. <laughs> And so we're, we're expecting an active bid list, and we're looking forward to that uh, opportunity on July 8th and continuing through August 2nd. Are there any questions? Thank you. Um, just a couple of quick questions, if I may, Mr. Sabanash. Looking at, from an environmental standpoint, what is the worst case and best case scenario that we have to deal with? Now, prior to the, the or from the initial environmental information, nobody mentioned the M word, methane. Mm -hmm. But we found methane. Now, people say, well, you should have expected methane. It's a trash heap that produces, that's what, where methane comes from. Mm -hmm. So, to me, that was a surprise. Mm -hmm. Maybe to you, maybe to other people, it was a surprise. But to me, it was a surprise. Mm -hmm. What where are we at with that square of dirt to know to some degree of assurance that we have a handle on any future surprises? Um, well, when the, I, th I think when the northern study was done, it was for petrochemicals. Methane's not a petrochemical. Um, it's not unusual to find methane, but I've also got examples where we haven't. Um, so it might lend itself to the discussion of that the methane is not coming from the site itself. It might be migrating. Um, we've had sites that have substantially less compactive quality and don't have methane problems. So methane is a gas that moves within a strata that may not have been defined by the site at all but might be affecting the site. Um, in terms of the geotechnical issues, um, we've taken what we think is a responsible approach. Uh, you never know exactly what geotechnical. When they get the sheep's foot rollers out there, some things can give way and there might be some pleasant surprises as well. So. That's the risk and the reward attached to anything that's below the grade is as many soil borings as you do. Uh, it's not a guarantee that every one of those soil borings is going to be representative of the best or the worst case scenario, but we've run an awful lot of them. I mean, we've got a good handle on the nature of the soils. We've come up with an approach that is adaptable and is sort of a middle-of-the-road approach. So we could deal with some bad conditions, and we could deal with the uh, opportunities that we find when we have good conditions as well. And we're not giving up yet on... Uh, the ability to have our uh, geotechnical engineers work through alternatives that might be less costly. Second question, still lingering on the methane issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps it's not appropriate with your background to answer this, but what types of health hazards does this, does this equip uh, our employees with? Well, when In using this building, you talk about managing it, can it be effectively managed, can be mm -hmm. fairly easily managed, but... Uh, my concern isn't the bricks and sticks, it's the people who's inside of it. Now, given that we have a project that's been up and running for 10 years, I think the system is great. It's working, and we don't have any of those side effects. Uh, what we're trying to do within that system is it is a bit, little bit like ventilating an attic. Um, we're creating a, a, a strata of perforated rock or perforated pipe and rock, and we're spraying a liquid membrane over the top of that to provide the mechanism that traps materials in that zone. It's got passive ventilation, meaning there's just open vents on one side of the building, and then we're exhausting up at the roof. So it's a fairly simple system. I mean, it may sound complex, but it's actually fairly similar to a lot of attic conditions that many, many people have. Um, so it's effective at containing that material. We'll be taking additional precautions. Um, wherever we have control joints, we'll be looking to caulk those so we get some resiliency in that joint. So we'll put a belt and suspenders on the floor slab to make sure that we're doing as much as po humanly possible to contain it. Um, but the membrane technologies and the like that have come up over the last 10 years are far superior to what we have in a building that's been around for 10 years that we feel very comfortable with the ability to control it. Thank you. 
Thank you, Chair. Chairman, uh, is there any health, I mean, uh, useful purpose for the methane? We're not at a part where we won't have an eternal flame. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> We're not out of parts per million that has that high strong. concentrations. We yeah. don't have a byproduct use. Otherwise, actually, we're working on a project where it's proximate to a landfill, and the county is looking at actually having waste management pipe methane over to the building. We're not at that level. It's, it's small levels, but it's a level that, again, given the concern about the longevity of the building, the, the people working in that facility, it's prudent to deal with it in this manner. But we're not generating. Okay. I wish I could say that, you know, we struck oil or something like that yeah. and could fund, you know, city resources for the coming decades, but that's yeah. not the case. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chairman. Weren't uh, test borings taken out there about four or five years ago? Yes. And uh, weren't some of these details discovered at that point? Uh, the geotechnical issue, soil conditions, we knew that there were fill conditions on the site, but the presence of methane has to go through a testing process with probes and the like, and I believe that was completed. Was there any suggestion of uh, radon gas? Uh, none. None. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Council Number Council Agenda 556 Committee met and discussed the issue of the Community Policing Unit and the Street Crimes Unit and the request for 175,000 be referred to the Committee of the Whole with a favorable recommendation from the Finance Committee and that the Police Department maintain the Community Policing and Street Crimes Unit at this time. Is there a motion? Over here. Alderman Vanderweel. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll make a motion to file this document and then I will, with that, I will take item number six and make a motion to accept and adopt that item because they're seeing that they're uh, connected. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to file both documents, number five and number six. Uh, under, with to file with um, approval. Right. So, do we have any discussion under this? Alderman Falk. Thank you, Madam Chair. Are we to receive any sort of presentation tonight? I, is that later on in the agenda? No, we will do that right away. Okay, that's sort discussion. of tied to this though, isn't it? So can we, can we include that as part of the discussion? So on you would like them to give their presentation now? Please. Um, Officer Williams or Chief Kirk, whoever is giving the presentation, please come up. I could. Um, I could ask Lieutenant Williams to... Uh... Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, did ask Lieutenant Williams, along with Deputy Chief Shervin, to prepare some documents uh, for this meeting tonight. Uh, however... Uh, we are here to answer any questions. Uh, uh, Lieutenant Williams is the one who will and did present or prepare this presentation here tonight. Um, also, I had some documents for the uh, white paper. If I would just sh share them with you before you leave here tonight, it's some documents that pertain uh, uh, to the issue of uh, where I, I view it as a, a, a team of uh, Sheboygan, where we're one department of many. And if, in fact, uh, some of the issues that arise 
Uh, as that did arise in the white paper that once uh, clarification has been made that perhaps as a team, aldermen, uh, department heads can speak out in support of uh, departments once clarification has been made. So at this point, once again, uh, Lieutenant Williams, if you uh, could, and I, we only have one microphone, I, I believe. Um, Otherwise, we can just move back and forth. Yes, Officer Williams, you could just clip, could you clip on that mic, and, or is that going to work for you? Um, all right. Actually, I'll use this one up okay. here. All right. Can someone flip the lights down? Maybe we'll be able to see a little better. Thank you. Maybe put these up here. I don't know if that helps. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair, Council Members. Uh, I'm going to be giving a presentation about our, uh, our budget, our overtime, and uh, some possible fixes in the future. I'm going to start off by giving you a little bit of a background as to how we got here today. Currently, there's uh, 42 known gang members operating in the city of Sheboygan, and in the past nine months, the number of gangs has grown from 37 to 42. The amount of drugs coming into uh, Sheboygan has steadily increased, as evidenced by this chart, which shows the drug incidents which have resulted in arrest. And if you look at 2007, right now we are on pace to at least equal or go beyond the number of arrests for drug incidents which we had last year. There's been an increase in the number of weapons we encounter on different complaints. This is just a small picture of some of the issues the city of Sheboygan must address. Our total number of arrests has continued to rise over the years. How do we, as a police agency and a city, deal with these types of problems? Policing is done in two different manners, reactive and proactive policing. What is reactive policing? Reactive policing, police respond to public calls for help. Citizens will call and will respond to those, and our citizen contact is almost empty, other, almost over, other than the fact that we might get some statements from them in trying to assist and find suspects in these types of complaints. When we're not responding to public calls, we're expected to openly patrol to deter any type of wrongdoing. This type of policing is not real efficient and doesn't help solve future problems that are going on. This is a traditional style of policing, a just the facts ma'am style of policing. Proactive policing, with the assistance of citizens, will identify threats to the community and target potential criminals. This is done by analyzing uh, different information that might be available to us in using specialized units. Some of these specialized units are the community policing use unit, street crimes unit, and a unit that we've been trying to get going which will target internet predators. Citizens, with proactive policing, citizens and police work together to prevent crime. Reactive policing is the core of what we as police officers do. We must maintain a sufficient amount of officers on the street in order to perform reactive policing and when we have that met we can start doing proactive policing in order to address the concerns that the community has. Reactive policing is not enough. We need to continue doing proactive policing. Our table of organization calls for 91 sworn officers and 40 support staff. Currently we're at 82 sworn officers. We are nine officers down. Th support staff, we are too short. 
These positions were not filled because there was no money available or the position was unfunded at the time. We have had one full-time officer position that has been unfunded. Our operating budget for this year is at $10,403,441. Of that, 94.3% constitutes personnel cost. 5.7% is all the rest of the costs that are used in order to run a police department. What are some of these costs? Personnel costs cover wages, overtime, Social Security, FICA, retirement, uh, vacation, etc. cetera. Uh, the other operating costs that we have involve gasoline, vehicle maintenance and repairs, IS maintenance, training, ammunition, supplies, telephones, and interfacing systems with some of the other agencies that we have to work with. So how do we get here today? Well, number one, because of increases of cost of goods and new contract wages and increase, uh, new contract wage increases, our 2007 budget increased by $540,000. However, the mayor and the council said we must maintain a 0% increase in our budget. Therefore, we needed to reduce our expenses, which was done by not filling positions. This, uh, this created a shortage of manpower. Now, our overtime account has been artificially lowered in the past. Uh, previous mayors and councils have told us this is what your overtime is, but they also knew it was not enough, and they said they would co uh, cover that cost at the end of the year. Mayor Perez told us we would need to stay within our, budget, our budgeted overtime. Because of this, our administration and shift captains brainstormed different ways to immediately control these costs, and the chief made the decision to suspend the community policing unit and the street crimes units. Again, we must remember that we must first provide coverage on the streets for the safety of the officers and the citizens, and so that we can respond to calls for help from these citizens. The $175,000 that we're asking for is just a short-term fix to the overtime budget that we have right now. In 2008, our projected shortfall is going to be $750,000 if we remain at a 0% increase and include the maintenance costs for the new building that's going to be built. I'll talk about some of the overtime that we have here. Our budgeted overtime for 2007 is $338,490. As of May 31st, 2007, our year-to-date overtime has been $144,000. $394. If we continue at the current rate of overtime using 2006 figures and trend, our projected overtime is going to be $521,087 at the end of the year. Again, $175,000 is only a short-term fix for this problem, but it is a necessary fix in order to continue with proactive policing. We have started to take a closer look at where all the overtime is being used within our department. Starting in April, we've been keeping track of the overtime usage, and this graph represents the overtime used in April and May by patrol, the three patrol shifts, as well as CID, Criminal Investigation Division. From this graph, you can see the major portion of this is holiday stray time. That is a contractual issue. We are a 24-7 operation, and we're required to work all holidays. And because of that, based on contract, officers are entitled to the pay for holiday straight time. That is a major portion of this particular two-month time span. The next biggest portion that you see here is investigative. 15% and with the uh, one on the holiday, it's 16% of our total overtime budget for that two-month period. Yes. All the, way, all the way around? Yes. Okay, if you, look, if you look on your handouts on the back, it uh, should be the third page. Right there is a handout where you should be able to read it a little bit better. Sure. Okay. Uh, the investigative nature of this, um, to quote Mayor Perez, the police can't stop doing their job when eight hours come. When we're handling a complaint, time is of the essence, Evidence must be collected, and we need to do the job until we can get that uh, situation resolved, or at least to a point where we can continue with it at a later state, later time. Uh, for that reason, we've got 15% of our uh, 
overtime is because of different types of complaints that we have to deal with. Now, we as a police department have looked at that, and we do not just automatically give overtime for any type of a complaint you're on. We do review the types of complaints that come in and the type of investigation that needs to be done, and then we will then allow the officers to continue overtime if it is one of those cases that need to get completed immediately or needs to have information over to the DA's office. If it's something such as uh, a barking dog or a noise complaint or something like that, that can wait till the next day. All right, but if it's a sexual assault, burglary, um, you know, robbery, something of that nature, we need to deal with that incident right now, and we need to get all the evidence that we can possibly get at that time so the investigation will continue. Some of the uh, other contractual issues, um, unfortunately, it's the nature of the job. We arrest people, and when we arrest people, we have to go to court uh, for the prosecution. Uh, and because of that, our call-out for court purposes was 9.8%. On the flip side of that, if you look down at the bottom, there's court cancellations. 2.3% of the court cancellations is another thing that we cannot control. What that is, uh, many times uh, the uh, uh, defendants, the suspects in these cases, wait until the last minute uh, to go through the system, and then at the last minute they'll put a plea in. And at that time, we're given a notice that we do not need to appear in court. This is partially contractual as well as many times we go to court once you're there, they say you're not needed, and you walk right back out. Uh, again, that's something that we can't control. That's something that the DA's office or the, uh, the suspects have some control with their attorneys in. Um, one of the areas that uh, uh, everybody seems to be concerned about is posted overtime. If you look at the posted overtime, between the overtime and the holiday overtime, it comes to 11%. Uh, in the newspaper on Sunday, I saw that Sheriff Helmke stated that his department has 10% posted over time, and they're fully staffed, and we're nine officers down. We are trying to do the best that we can in order to control these costs. Also keep in mind that when it comes to posted overtime, some of the posted overtime is for different festivals, such as Greek Fest and, and, and Brat Days. Those costs are repaid to the city for our overtime. Right now, we have overtime posted overtime because we are short on the shifts, and we're short for various reasons. Um, uh, number one, manpower shortages. Number two, we've got people that are out on, uh, on, on family leave or possibly, uh, right now I don't think we have any, but uh, on uh, workman's comp. But because of that, we have posted overtime so that we can fill our shifts to a staff level that is safe for the officers as well as being able to give the services to the citizens of Sheboygan. Uh, some of the other ones are just a little bit uh, odds and ends, uh, special teams uh, such as... Uh, uh, the SWAT team, dive team, honor guard, and uh, some of the other ones that would pertain to, I put a handout in your uh, list as well on some of the overtime use, uh, but the other where it says 7.5%, that pertains to uh, travel time for training, uh, demonstrations, probation registrations, school functions, and again, the, the, uh, the schools themselves pay a portion of the overtime for the school fu functions, which uh, we are paying overtime on, so we do receive some of that back. Lieutenant, thank you, Madam Chair. Lieutenant Williams, can you uh, help me understand why we only have data for April and May and how this data might look different if we had a representative 12 months? Sure. Uh, we only have it for April and May because we just started doing this in April. Wow. So Unbelievable. Can this change? Yes, it can. Um, if you look at the holiday straight time, this two-month period had three holidays, three paid holidays in it. If this were November and December, this would look a little bit different. So this could change uh, as we get more information, and we're continuing to track this right now. And the general overtime pot of money is about $700,000 a year in for, that vicinity? For us? Y yes. No, sir. It's $338,000 is what's budgeted for the overtime. Okay, 338. Yes, sir. And right now, if we continue at the same pace, we're projected to be at 520, 000, roughly $520,000. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, two questions. Number one, is my assumption correct that overtime would tend to increase in the warmer months of the year? That is uh, correct. Um, because of the staffing levels that we have, uh, vacations and people out on uh, um, family leave or sick leave, uh, it does tend to increase. Uh, in addition, we do get busier during the summer when we generally tend to have less officers on the road. And secondarily, 
Is it correct that, uh, this is my assumption, um, that in paying overtime, uh, when you're asking officers if they're willing to take some extra hours, as opposed to um, directing folks assigned duty, there's probably a mix of that. Both happen. But uh, I think as you uh, tap folks for overtime, oftentimes you're asking the younger officers with less tenure to serve those hours first, which means you're paying a lower rate per, per hour. Is that correct or not? Well, that's not necessarily correct. Um, when it comes to overtime issues like that, there is, um, um, it is contractual. And so senior officers get the first option to take the overtime. Uh, and if they don't take it, then the, the, the uh, younger officers can take it. So it, it is given to them uh, with the option of taking it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Lieutenant Williams, you were uh, quoted in the paper yesterday saying that hiring more officers is not necessarily, necessarily the answer since uh, new officers cost about $70,000 a year and it takes a few months to get them up to speed. I guess my question is, is that after the six to nine, after the six to nine months, if you were fully staffed or very close to being fully staffed, that would do a lot to take away from your overtime demands once you got those new people on board. Is that correct? It would take away some of the overtime demands. However, uh, again, a lot of it is contractual. And with more officers out there doing more work, uh, you know, the assumption is that they're going to be making more arrests. So they may have to go to court as well. So you could see an increase in the court overtime. Uh, but on the flip side, you would hopefully see a decrease in the posted overtime because you wouldn't need to have that. Thank you. The other, if I may, just the other issue is just because um, some of the investigative uh, might be handled as well. You may not have quite as much investigative overtime if we have uh, more officers that are out on the street. But that's always hit or miss. You never know what. You could get a big, take the uh, uh, landmark fire. Uh, that was huge. And, and not only did it take a lot of resources from the police department, but the, from the fire department as well. Uh, and that was one of the biggest reasons that our uh, overtime has increased so rapidly this year because we spent a lot of man hours um, working that fire as well as the follow-up investigation in that fire. As far as I would just wish to add just a couple points to that. As far as the overtime, we want to make sure that you understand that just giving us more officers will not necessarily decrease the overtime because of some of these uh, court cancellations and things of this nature. It's, it's not as simple as that, yet at the same time, one would assume posted overtime would go way down then. It, it certainly would. The other point I want to make is that it can, the other point I'd want to make is it could be, we could address proactive policing more. If there's problems, if, if we have more officers out there, there's enough time for the officers to be just addressing uh, gang activities instead of just handling the complaints and, and handling the arrest. They can proactively attack some of those problems. So that would be the other issue as far as having, having more officers out there. Thank you. Alderman Hanna has a question. Well, thank you. Uh, Lieutenant Williams, my question is, uh, I think I've got a good handle on the, on the problem and the, what are some of your solutions? What, what would you like us to do as a council to try to uh, alleviate overtime, uh, to improve community policing, uh, to, to go after the, the drug and the gang issues, which are, which are critical in our community? What are some of your solutions? Where should we go? Okay. Well, what I have here is a slide. We as an administration, uh, we have been brainstorming different ideas to help control the overtime and to get officers that we need both to apply reactive and proactive policing techniques. Uh, we need to do more than just reactive policing. We need to do proactive policing at this stage. Some of the different things that we have uh, been looking at, uh, and again, these are brainstorming ideas. We do not have anything that is in a, in a final uh, stage at this point. We're still trying to get some more ideas and learn how some of these things might work for us. Uh, but the first one there is uh, we are looking at adding either part-time or full-time community service officers. This will alleviate some of the workload that officers have by handling some of the more uh, 
non-essential complaints, uh, such as maybe parking lot accidents or other minor complaints that they would be able to take care of. Uh, another area that we're looking at is volunteers or Citizens Academy of graduates. Uh, we have an individual that is looking with other departments that have these types of programs to see how it works within their departments and how they apply this. I also want to keep in mind, uh, have everybody keep in mind here, that we use numerous, numerous volunteers right now. Uh, these volunteers help our community policing unit uh, through programs such as Neighbors Against Drugs, uh, Triad, and Crime Stoppers. Without the assistance of these volunteers right now, these programs would not be running. So we are already using volunteers uh, in one sense, and we're looking at other ways that we might be able to employ the help of volunteers or Citizens Academy graduates. Uh, another area that we're looking at is cost sharing within departments of the city. Um, right now, we need to pay from our budget uh, for IS maintenance. We pay them for their services. We also pay DPW for some of their services or goods when we purchase from them. Uh, however, we have a, a radio technician that does numerous work for all the agencies within this city as well as some of the county, and we're not getting paid for his services. We also provide dispatch services for the fire department, and the entire budget for the dispatch is coming out of the police. Perhaps it's time that uh, we have a, a cost sharing within some of these other departments that might allow us to uh, hire some more officers. Uh, another area that we're looking at is the transfer of duties upon retirement. When an officer or supervisor retires, we look at that position and see if we can transfer some of those duties to another person, uh, possibly eliminating it or just a change of the types of duties that are, that are being done. Uh, another area that we've looked at, uh, we've talked about proactive policing and the need for analysis of the data that comes up. Um, we'd like to consider uh, mapping analysis with engin engineering department with possibly some of their programs in order to assist us in our analysis of future crime trends. Uh, another area is uh, an internal IS person. Uh, policing has changed drastically uh, in the last uh, 15 years, and so much of it involves computers, computer crimes, and how we're going to obtain that evidence, retain that evidence, uh, and we have a detective right now that does quite a, few, quite a bit of work just on IS issues. Uh, perhaps we need to look at replacing that individual with a civilian that does IS uh, um, techniques and have a detective get back to doing detective work. Another area is uh, joint training with the county. With a shortage of personnel and, and, and the issues that are going on, it's very difficult for us to do in-house training because it requires you to have a... a, a an instructor there, a trainer there as well, and in some cases two or three trainers in order to do the proper training, as well as getting officers off the road in order to do the training. Perhaps we can look at joint training with the county where we can share instructors between the two uh, departments in order to accomplish a little more in-house training. And then lastly, um, we have to consider a reduction of services if we're unable to uh, meet the needs uh, right now. Uh, if we can't get the people that we need out on the streets so that we can do just basic uh, reactionary policing, then we need to start looking at a reduction of the services that are provided. Alderman Hanna, do you want to ask a question? Just one, one follow-up. If you were to point to one department in the state outside of Sheboygan that you view as a model in utilizing some of these techniques to, to have a handle on their budget and at the same time maintaining a high level of service, which departments do you admire? I unfortunately could not give you that answer, but perhaps uh, the chief might be able to assist you with that. As far as the uh, departments around the state that I that I would look up to would be uh, Racine, uh, La Crosse, um, Appleton. Those three immediately come to uh, to mind. I, I would, as I mentioned before, I wanted to share some of the documents uh, that I have, and with those documents, you'll see a comparison of numbers of officers per thousand when you uh, examine uh, police departments, you'll examine or you'll see uh, price per capita of policing that it costs the city here. Um, I think at this time it's probably more appropriate that I speak on some of these issues. I, I, Mike, you did, or Lieutenant Williams, you did a fantastic job in preparation. However, there's a couple key points I would like to say, and the key to the Sheboygan Police Department is a number of years back, we went from reactive policing, just strictly reactive, to community policing problem solving. We've been pushing that concept for years. 
but we must understand that the patrol function within the police department is essential and that's the backbone. Many people say it's the backbone of the police department. That's very, very true it is. We need to make sure that the number of officers on the street are there so when the citizens call for service that we respond. We do not. The last comment on, on this chart here says re uh, reduction in services. We have heard from uh, many aldermen and the mayor that we do not want a reduction of services to our people. And we are trying to, to do this, maintain the same level of service. However, there's a big difference between reactive policing and proactive policing. Now, we've gone away from reactive policing, and that's a traditional model that needs not to, uh, to go back to. So with that, we sat down, and when we, we started to analyze our overtime, you must remember that years ago, our overtime was was low. It was it was low in the budget, and it was it was intentional, because at the end of the year the money was there. Chief, you do what you need to do. We will cover your overtime at the end of the year. This year we were instructed to keep within our budget. I, I have to let you know that we came in with a zero percent budget. We we can do this, but this will change some of the policing, and we would get away from proactive policing to respond to reactionary police. You know, that's certainly not where we want to be. There are, we, we've sat down, when we began uh, to look at this, we, we took it very, very serious, and that's why you begin to see a real analysis of the overtime and where did this overtime go. I want to know why, and I had all departments start to chart, and we can share those, those bits of information with you. We just gave you a graph here, but there's a lot of work that's been going into this to analyze where our overtime is going. And some of it, and a lot of it, is just contractual obligations that we need to know or need to have a finger on so we can then look at what is posted overtime. Well, that's 11% of our overtime at this time is just posted. Now, please remember, we're down nine officers, yet the Sheriff's Department, we're at 11% for posted overtime, yet the Sheriff's Department that's full staff is at 10% for posted overtime. So th that's key. We're only using one more percent as percentages go in, in overtime. So when we began to brainstorm about some of these ideas, Lieutenant Williams is absolutely correct. We do use a lot of volunteers already in the Sheboygan Police Department. That's what community policing is all about. That's what problem solving is all about, that the police department does not handle the problems by ourselves anymore. We, act, we ask others to get involved and help us solve problems. It becomes a team approach to policing. But as we began to brainstorm some of this, uh, we could use, we, we uh, or at least I dealt with LTC, Lakeshore Technical College, last year to start a program of volunteers or paid part-time community service officers, yet we had no money in the budget at that time because they wished to be paid. Uh, we, we thought the program would be a paid program. We now look at possibly a use of a voluntary program of, of volunteers. Yet my understanding and speaking with the city attorney at the very end of, of the year, Lakeshore Tech for the Criminal Justice Association of the students where they would come from, this pool of students, they would ask for a small donation or a donation from the police department. We check in with the city attorney, I can't make a donation. As a police department, I cannot make a donation to a private entity. Yet, if we deem this program appropriate, Alderman Gisha, I, I believe you're the one who first brought it up. Well, the, uh, the Common Council could. I mean, we as a Common Council, I'm not, I'm not a Common Council member, but <laughs> <laughs> I like this chair, though. Um, but the Common Council could, and we could get these programs up and running. Years ago, for, for several, uh, under uh, Mayor Perez and under Mayor Schramm, we asked for part-time uh, more uh, part-time community uh, service officers. Uh, it didn't go through at that time, but that's another area that I believe we could expand upon. Um, there are other areas, um, short-term, long-term. Um, Lieutenant Williams hit on the uh, detective who's doing I IS work. He shouldn't be doing that. In a perfect world, IS should be doing it, and some departments do that. They have someone downloading all the video recorders and the tape, tape interviews and things of this nature, keeping track of uh, sex offenders, things of this nature, yet we have a detective doing that. 
and we've been trying to transfer some of this to a secretary in our detected division so it's uh, more cost efficient. Um, mapping, of course, we believe uh, Mr. Hornis could help us out with that, but now that needs their assistance and their, their free time. Um, as far as um, a municipal court, uh, we hope uh, that perhaps we could charge back municipal court for the sergeant's time of overtime that he's tied to municipal court. Uh, if everyone would, would chip in a little bit, crossing guards, there's been talk that perhaps as the uh, school resource officer program, that crossing guards could be partially paid for by the school district. I mean, it's, it's a small amount, but it could be something. One that I like that I don't think a whole lot of people like is dispatch, where our dispatch costs about a million dollars a year. Yet we dispatch for the fire department, it's been estimated at 25% five, of the time of dispatching for the fire department, it's 25%. Out of a million dollars, it's $250,000. Now I know we're taking from one pot to pay another. However, $250,000, that's three officers that immediately I, I could place on the road. And I, I'd say some of these concepts do exist now because we pay IS for maintenance and we pay IS for the uh, computers that we purchase. So some of these are brainstorming ideas and I want you to understand and fully appreciate some of the efforts that have been going on with some of the people and some of the unions and some of the uh, members of the unions have sat at the tables with us to say, listen, let's really brainstorm and come up with some, some good ideas. So. Okay, I have a couple aldermen that have some questions here. Um, Alderman Clayhunas, you're first. Thank you. Um, either um, Chief Kirk or Lieutenant Thomas. Um, in t I have just a couple questions. Under seasonal, on the table of organizational, seasonal, these are, are these um, employees, officers, who are they? The seasonal, that is uh, crossing guards. Crossing guards, okay. Yes, that's about, uh, right now it's approximately $20,000 of our uh, okay. uh, personnel cost. Okay. So we've cut down on crossing guards as well. Right now we have, uh, I believe it's seven crossing guards. Right. Okay. Then uh, there was another question. Um, uh, when you said, how do we get here, you said you had a pro the proactive units were suspended. What other units were considered in terms of cutting costs? Or was that just right away, that's the only thing you considered? What else would you have considered as maybe a place we could have cut costs? Other units, <clears throat> excuse me, we only have two other specialized units, okay. um, school resource officers and uh -huh. the drug unit. Okay. Um, school resource officers, I believe, are uh, valuable to the point where we would not deem that to be looked at at this time. Um, hugely important in the schools. Um, the other one was the drug unit. Um, certainly with the conditions in the city at the present time, we would not uh, deem that to be looked at. Is it? And if I may just follow up on that, we did look at uh, <coughs> the other cost of operating the police department, which was approximately five hundred and ninety-seven thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Um, however, that's a very small amount when you consider running an entire police department. But we did look at the cost of those things, and if you look on the back sheet uh, of the handout I gave you, I did break down from our budget any dollar amount that was over one thousand dollars. Um, and those are large ones. And if you look at the biggest one there, $135,000 for gasoline. You know, again, we're a 24-7 operation. Um, if we start taking away some of these things, we're going to have a very, very difficult time doing our job out there. Thank you. Okay. Alderman Bulk. Thank you, Madam Chair. Are we to receive any more information other than this brainstorming tonight? Are we going to see impact with uh, financials? No, sir. This is the end of the presentation? Yes, sir. I'm a big fan of community policing, and I'm, I like and respect Chief Kirk, but I am profoundly disappointed in the presentation being made tonight. Please contrast what we're seeing tonight with what we saw from the Sheboygan Fire Department about, a, what, two or three weeks ago, a month ago. There were detailed spreadsheets. There, were, there was a month of conversations with the chief and his leadership uh, till 8, 9 o'clock at night, every single weekend, for four or five hours a weekend conversations on scenarios. Chief, we don't believe you. Prove it to us. Chief, we still don't believe you. Prove it to us. Chief, look at this information we're getting from the citizenry. They don't believe you. Prove it to us. And this is what we get tonight. We, uh, the police department has come to the Common Council, came to the Finance Committee with concerns of shutting down community policing, 
got the city all up in arms, don't shut it down. I, I made the motion authorizing or, or suggesting that we order them to continue operating as is and we'll find the money. I was the one that, that made that motion under the good faith, acting under good faith that we would receive information on how we would save money. Not to vote incremental dollars for that, but how we would find that absorbed. You have a $10.4 million budget and you can't find $175,000. That's 1.6% of your budget that's a solve. Families in Sheboygan, businesses in Sheboygan, every single day deal with 1.6% shortfalls. And what I'm hearing tonight, and I could be wrong, and I'm, I'm, I'm just profoundly disappointed, but what I'm hearing tonight is no solutions. I don't see a single solution up there. I see some ideas that haven't been thought out. I hear we need $175,000, and you better give it to us. Um, and I just want to establish my bona fides here. I wore a uniform for 13 years. I spent eight months flying drug missions throughout South and Central America. I love cops, I hate drugs, and I, am, I just can't believe this is what we're seeing. I had a car blown up in front of my house a month ago. You may recall this picture in the Sheboygan Press where the car exploded in a residential neighborhood two doors down from a judge, an acting city attorney, uh, attorney in the city, an acting alderman, a member of the school board and the president of the chief and fire commission. We have cars being exploded in residential districts and we, uh, the police department comes to us for $175,000, 1.6% of their budget with no solutions. Uh, I've asked for three weeks, offered my, my help in analyzing the budget, asked for it, got no analysis, got a printout, but got no analysis. We have no new information tonight with which we can act when we reconvene in a council, and I'm very disappointed, and I appreciate your time, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I echo a lot of uh, frustration that uh, Alderperson uh, Falk brings up, but I guess I come from a little bit of a different angle on it uh, that I would like to add. Um, my frustration comes from being here tonight dealing with a shortage. That was more or less, don't worry about it, we'll take care of it. it happens every year. The money will come forth every year. That is not prudent budgeting. I'm not blaming you guys. I'm saying from the city's standpoint, that's not prudent budgeting. If we know it's going to be there anyway, then it's just a funny little shell game with numbers for people to sit back and say, we have a balanced budget or we don't have a balanced budget or our increase is only this. And this doesn't just go back for one year, two years. This goes back many years, it's my understanding. But this is kind of the, the, the nod and wink. It's not fair to you guys to come back in and, and grovel. <laughs> Sometimes it feels that way, I'm sure, for $175,000. It's also not fair not to have dollar figures attached to brainstorming ideas. I'll give you an example. From the Appleton Police Department uh, website, they have VIP volunteers. You're talking about volunteers and so forth. Working with almost every unit in the department. They even borrow them to other city departments. Over 3,300 volunteer hours donated. Taxpayer savings, $60,000. I think if I, I don't want to put words in Alderman Bauck's mouth, but I think that's kind of what he was looking for. Okay, if we do this, here's the savings, or if we do this, this is how we can, not necessarily even savings, how we can multiply our force factors in some ways. Example, Wisconsin Rapids, uh, Auxiliary Police Department, 22 members. Unit donates thousands of hours, donates thousands of hours every year, myriad of events. All the festivals, the same festivals we have, they're volunteering to do a lot of the work. Picnics, fireworks, Fourth of July's, River Blues Fest, et cetera, et cetera. The unit has the authority to write city ordinance violations and parking tickets. Besides, and these are volunteers. And I, 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 if I can understand right, you're saying there's a lot of ideas and thoughts out there. And if I can act as mediator here a little bit, the idea would be to take those ideas and thoughts and put them to numbers. Otherwise, we really do have nothing. We have ideas and thoughts. I said from the beginning with this additional request, that I wouldn't vote for it unless we're fixing it so we don't do this every year. So you guys don't have to do this every year. So, so the public doesn't have to go through this every year. It's ridiculous we have to go through this every year. It's a broken, ugly, rotten process that's unfair to you and I think unfair to the citizens. Uh, and 
either we have an honest budget up front where we know all the costs are in and we do it and go, or we don't have an honest budget up front. And it's not your fault, and, it, and the chief knows, because I called the chief, I talked to the chief this morning, and I came to his office and vented my frustration. My frustration is not over the police department, although I would like, from an Alderman Bauch standpoint, see more work put into results from some of these brainstorming ideas. My frustration is over this process. The, the feelings between the police department and the council stinks. The feelings between the council and the police department, to some degree, stink. How do we bridge this and break this logjam of distrust and, um, and, and skepticism? I looked at Nina, did a study of police operations and staffing. What they did is they went to a third party intervener or, or almost like a marshal situation, consultant, I hate to use consultant, and I hate consultants, just so we need another $50,000 cons uh, consulting bill. But if that's what it takes to get everybody together to, to move this forward, to have a realistic, to, so that it isn't you guys saying, we need this amount of officers, somebody else, the, some, the council saying, no, we think you can get by with this. If we have a third party come in, from a consulting situation and review this, then, then we all know, we stop the argument. Right now, I honestly don't see a, a way to break this log jam between the council and the police department. Alderman Bauch volunteered three weeks ago to come on in. I know I've done the same thing. I want to come in and be part of this process. I want to come in and try to help. I, I, don't, I haven't been invited in. I would like to be. I'll work three o'clock in the morning if that's when the shift needs help to work on these processes. But I would just like to see more involvement and more actual examples, such as volunteers taking away $60,000 in saving. It's a frustrating, frustrating situation, and it has to be horribly frustrating for you guys. Because I'm new at this, and I'm dealing with a budget situation that I believe the budget was wrong last year. It wasn't actually, if you were told you're going to get the money, it wasn't, and the money isn't there, it should have been in the budget last year. Uh, I will not vote for this money again. It's really got to be in there, and we really have to be dealing with real numbers going forward, and we really all got to get along and work out these future opportunities and brainstorms, because th it, is, it is ridiculous and unfair to the citizens in this council and to you guys not to have a real number in there. So my first, I'm sorry for my tone. My frustration shows, and... Deputy Chief Sherman heard me this morning, too. It's just a frustration over the process that must be blown up and fixed. Somebody's got to break this logjam of trust and get rid of the fear. And uh, that's where I'm coming from. So was there a question in there? I'm not sure. But maybe a, com maybe a comment from you guys would be helpful. If you share the frustration or not. Yes, Chief Kirk. As far as any uh, presentation by a fire department, uh, if you look at this situation, they, they presented this five years ago, and this work that you say <coughs> that was presented was five years in coming. Now, this budget was months in coming. This, we addressed it. We didn't come to you asking for 175. We said we presented a 0% budget. This is the way it is. This is where we are. You want to find money? We're, we, you look at our personnel account. We are a number of officers that we have not filled. We covered $540,000 that were increases for this year. Of that $540,000, there is some issue with overtime. The issue of overtime has always been here. It's been artificially lowered over the years. This year, we were addressed that it will stay the budget is 0% increase, and we got to the 0% increase. As far as uh, your neighborhood, there's a lot of different things that go on in a lot of different neighborhoods in this community. I take pride in what our officers do. I take pride in the efforts that they're part of. If you would have been aware of the activity that was taking place this weekend, you would be very, very honored by what our officers have done and accomplished this weekend. If we were to stay at a 0% increase, we were going to run out of overtime by October. As far as any other documentation, it looks as though we would probably be out of overtime earlier than that. 
now as we see the numbers come in. As far as, as flying missions over South America, Alderman, my family comes from South America, my wife's family. My brother-in-law lost his life in some of the same missions you speak of. I feel honored that you take great pride in that. I take great pride in the loss of my brother-in-law. So thank you. Alderman Manny. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is a simple procedural question. Um, there is some perception periodically that perhaps there is some inefficiency in the way squads respond to complaints and issues and traffic stops. Uh, please, Chief, explain or, or Lieutenant Williams, explain the policy in squads responding. In what circumstances is it appropriate to have two squads versus one squad, et cetera? As far as uh, we, we now have one man squads or one person squads. Years ago when I worked the streets, we had two vehicle or two man squads. Um, depending on the type of complaint that you're responding to, if there's concerns for officer safety, we then send two squads. If it's later in the evening, and uh, we send two squads for officer safety. One is a backup unit to, to monitor what goes on. When the other officer is writing paperwork or has his eyes off the, squad, off, off the vehicles, we maintain observation. Second vehicle is a backup. Um, years ago, we could, we could get by with sending one unit. Of course, they had two, two people in it. Um, some of the minor complaints, one officer only responds to. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think this uh, whole discussion probably should be farther along than it is, agreeing with both Alderman Bauck and Alderman Gisha. Uh, I, I think, you know, from what I've heard behind the scenes that is not in this meeting this evening, there was some good brainstorming going on. There were some great, great ideas out there. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't seem like they've come any farther than the brainstorming stage at this time. You know, I, I, you know, one, one issue I look at, uh, you know, we have court cancellations at 2.3% is a contractual issue, which I believe, you know, that's your union. That's something that came up in the union contract, where if it's canceled within 24 hours just because you were supposed to be there, you get paid for it. Um, uh, I mean, I think there could probably be some concessions in the future on, on things of that sort. Um, I think the whole thing is a, is a, is a give and take. I do believe we need to use volunteers. Uh, if we look at, uh, I know there's some, maybe some uh, state statutes that uh, need to be uh, looked at, but uh, parade routes. We have officers on every corner in the parade route standing by the barricade, even though the street is closed, uh, for two to three hours, uh, and all of them are basically on overtime at that time because it's, you know, it's the holiday pay overtime thing, et cetera, et cetera. I think we need to look into this farther uh, than it has been. And, and I think, uh, you know, I, I believe an officer in a squad car on the street or in proactive policing is much more valuable than an officer standing at a barricade on a parade route. Uh, I, I think that there's a lot of things that can be done, but they need to go beyond the we've got an idea stage, and they need to be put to dollars like Alderman Balk said. Um, you know, there's... there's uh, you know, there, there's there's got to be got to be some give and take on both sides. Yeah, I think there's some great ideas out there, but they need to they need to need to be put to paper, and they need to be it needs to be discussed in an open manner, um, where you know the, the the mistrust can be put aside, and we can get some real numbers. I mean, it's uh, police department does a great job. I mean, proactive policing is a lot more effective than reactive policing, and we don't want to go back to reactive policing. You know, if we look at the safety of our city. It's not a perfect place, but we're doing a heck of a lot better than a lot of other places. And that's to the credit of our, credit of our police, police department. Uh, but right now we are in some budgetary tight times. Uh, we need to be inventive, and uh, we need to put these numbers, numbers to paper. Thank you. Alderman Vanderwill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Crime can happen everywhere. That's the part of society we live in. That's just the way it is today. And and this is frustrating, and that's one of the reasons why I voted against the budget last year, to show my frustration that, that something needs to change. And, and I agree with Alderman Gisha and, and everybody who spoke tonight. And what's also frustrating is the volunteering is a good idea. It's a great idea. 
but in the last six years, I've had, we've had people beg to volunteer, and they were looked at as pests. They were just begging, let me volunteer, show me what to do, let me do it. And they were looked at as, we don't want to deal with it. So maybe now we need to tell them, yeah, we want your help. Maybe now this council needs to say, yeah, <coughs> last six years, forget about it. Now we want you to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Do you have any further comments? I would say certainly, uh, I would say once again, certainly we met with Alderman Hanna. We spoke, I spoke to Alderman Gisha today. Um, we certainly are willing to sit down and discuss these concepts. We still await um, where the reorganizational committee finally puts us. Some of these decisions are sitting here waiting for some of this. So as uh, brainstorming uh, has uh, been the stage we're at right now, we certainly will uh, move on with, with these issues. Okay, thank you. Now we will move on to the motion to file with a favorable recommendation, items number five and six. Do we have any further discussion? One last time. See none, all in favor of filing, say aye with a favorable. Oh, sorry. We have a roll call. All those in favor of, uh, I'll start over. Roll call. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> What an I means. To accept and file with a favorable recommendation the two items, and that would be to finance the 175000 And this is Alderman Vanderweel. Thank you. Maybe so that we know exactly what we're voting on and so the public knows what we're voting on, maybe we should take five separate and then take six. You want to separate them now? I, I think that'd be the best idea. Okay, then we will vote. Uh, do we need a motion to change your <laughs> together? Uh, I'll just make a motion to file RC number 510708. And is there a second? Second. And that is with a favorable recommendation? Or you're canceling your original? Uh, I will then make a separate motion on item number six, which would accept and adopt. Okay. So. Item number five is the RC 5170708 oh, by finance, and the motion is to file, and we have a second. Uh, yes, yes. Okay, we will do a roll call on this. Four, I, well, no. no. I just want to be clear, no means I vote to not recommend the 175. This one is to file the document. Just to file. Yes. Aye. Thank you. Gesha. Aye. Hannibal died. Aye. 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 Clay Lewis. Aye. Manny. Aye. Meyer. Aye. Montemore. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Vanderwheel. Aye. Longman. Aye. Was. Motion passes. Moving on to number six. I'll make a motion to accept and, and adopt the RC. We have a motion to accept and adopt the RC, and we have discussed this. So moving on to a roll call vote on this also. We need a second. Oh, a second. second, sorry. We have a motion and a second. I don't, do we have to further discuss? I think we've discussed this. Warren. Aye. Sorry. Question. Alderman Manny. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm going to vote against this uh, based on the premise that until we know where the money's coming from, I don't think it's a responsible action. And um, that's the explanation for my vote. Alderman Bulk. Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, I, I intend to vote just because I don't have enough information. Uh, again, I hope it's clear and I hope there's no misunderstanding admire the police, can't wait to work on them and understand it better so we can make sure that those community policing programs don't go away, but I'm going to need to vote no on it tonight too. Okay, thank you. Alderman Heidemann. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So, so if we vote no on this, this basically just goes right back to finance and the police department is gonna come back to finance and ask for another 
$175,000, correct? Maybe. Oh, let me hit Alderman Ryan. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm going to vote yes for this as, as a short-term fix. As a short-term fix with, uh, with the understanding and the, uh, the confidence that this council and the police department will get together before the next budget and uh, solve this problem with some real numbers. Okay. And Alderman Bourne. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm going to vote for it for the same reasons as, Al as Alderman uh, Ryan. Uh, also, on the, uh, on the RC that we have in front of us on the reverse side, it does say that this is going to be coming from the General Fund Finance Department Interest and Investments. That's where the 175 will be coming from. Just to clarify that, Alderman Manning, if that clarifies your comment. Thank you. Alderman Vanderweel. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to make it clear that, that the police made a decision to cut community policing to make their 0% budget. There was some 60-some letters that went to finance. That generated this document. The police never asked for the money. So if we vote no, or if the council votes no, then we'll just, community policing will be cut. That, that's all. It, the police won't, I don't believe they'll come back and ask for the money. There just won't be community policing. So this was generated directly from the citizens that, that asked finance for help, basically. Okay, thank you. Alderman Wangaman. Thank you, Madam Chair. It is, of course, a temporary stopgap fix. And uh, it's a necessary stopgap fix, I think. And I agree that the relationship between the police department and the council stinks. And something has got to be done. This needs to be straightened out. It, we, we shouldn't have this. We should, we should have a, a, a real uh, dialogue going back and forth at all times. And uh, as Alderman Balk said, he wore a uniform for 13 years. I wore one for 28 years. And I did my service here on the streets of Sheboygan. So I have, I'm well aware of what's going on out there. Uh, things have changed, of course. But uh, something has to be done. But I'm going to vote yes for a, a stopgap fix, and I, I'm hoping and uh, th that this situation won't keep resenting itself, that this doesn't become a, a yearly ritual that we dance around in circles and try and get this thing uh, straightened out. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Manny. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I simply want to direct a comment to Alderman Boren and say uh, thank you for redirecting my gaze to clarify my mind. So uh, I do know where the dollars would be coming from in the short term, and therefore I will be supportive of uh, the motion. Thank you. Alderman Montemayor. Uh, uh, thank you, Chairman Meyer. There's lots of information this evening. I'm, just as another point of information, I've been reading some newspapers from 1986 and 1987. The exact same words, the exact same players. You could change the names of the mayor, you could change the date. It's all over again. This is not new. This has been going on a long time, a long, long time. I think it is time to solve the problem. Thank you. Alderman Gisha. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I agree. I've talked to previous mayors going way back and and this rotten situation ex exists way back then. And I, I thought long and hard about this. I, I mentioned earlier I would never vote for this again because there should never be a need to vote for this. But I'm going to roll the $175,000 dice that there's a window of opportunity here of mutual trust and respect that could be nurtured and that the doors can be opened and maybe... I'm an idealist, and I'll get it slammed in my face, but I, I like these guys, and I think they're willing to, to make a, a gesture here and a move here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bet $175,000 on it is what I'm going to do. Now, this is a complete change in history, such as Alderperson Montemayor mentioned, going back many administrations, but I'm personally betting the cash that that something can be worked out. And, and I'm not, this is not political grandstanding, 
I will never vote for a, a measure like this again that is not a quantified or, or do this again next year come July or August. Uh, I just will not. It is not prudent. So my intention is, is uh, for hope. And my vote yes is for hope that everybody can come to the table and work together rather than the, the skepticism that currently exists. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> we will move on to voting on item number six to file with a favorable recommendation. An I vote would be to file. A nay would be not accepting it. And I would like a roll call on this. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. I, I just want to explain the motion was to accept and adopt. So we'll be in filing. I just think it will be a recommendation to council to accept and adopt. Accept and adopt. Okay. All set? Board. Aye. Loud. No. Gesha. Aye. Hannah. Aye. Heidemann. Aye. Cleonis. Aye. Manny. Aye. Meyer. No. Montemore. No. Ryan. Aye. Vanderbilt. Aye. Wangerman. Aye. Nine ayes, three noes. Motion carries. Moving on to item number seven, RC number 800708 by City County Shared Services June, from June 18th, 2007, Council Agenda Number 661. Your committee to whom was referred the task of studying possible shared services with the county submits the findings of, the, of a study of the combined joint dispatch. The City County Shared Services Committee unanimously supports combined dispatch and requests consideration from the Common Council. Um, Alderman Bourne. Madam Chair, uh, because of the importance of this issue, and I think the amount of discussion that has to go into it, I would move to hold this document until hopefully, hopefully a July 9th Committee of the Whole meeting. I've taken the liberty to call Gary Maples, who is, uh, who is a member of the Shared Services Committee, who did the PowerPoint presentation that we have with the documents. And Mr. Maples uh, tentatively told me if you see fit to call a meeting on July 9th, that he would be available to do this PowerPoint presentation, which takes about 30 to 35 minutes. I've seen the presentation actually twice. It's, it's very impressive. And then he's, he opens, up, opens it up for questions. And I think uh, Lieutenant Reinfeldt, if she could attend that meeting, uh, her input would be very, very, very helpful on this. Uh, Lieutenant Reinfeldt today was kind enough to forward two more documents that we do not have in our packet. And one of the contentious items that may come out of this presentation is the recommendation for a communication center, center shift supervisor and then a center manager. And she was kind enough to forward me the job descriptions, which are not in this report. And I think both of those job descriptions are going to need some discussion. And also, uh, there was a letter from David Sleeter that was not included with our packet today. And Mr. Sleeter is the director of Rock County, the Janesville area, communications director for that center. And he critiqued uh, Mr. Maple's presentation. And I also think if the council had a copy of this, it would be very helpful. For, for those reasons, I would like to hold this for a future meeting where it could give, be given due diligence. And we have a second. Um, did you still wish to speak? Alderman Vanderweel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Alderman Bourne. I was going to make that motion for the same reason. I was going to ask Madam Chair to, to contact Gary Maples for the PowerPoint. So thank you. And um, I just wanted to state my opinion. I think we need to decide if we're, uh, if we're going to go forward with this before we talk about job descriptions and positions and things like that. Thank you. OK, thank you. So we have a motion and a second to hold Item number seven, under discussion. Thank Holman, you. Hannah. Thank you. I've had the opportunity to see the presentation, and Gary Maples does an excellent job. 
Uh, and I do think it would be valuable for all members of the council to see it. Uh, they, they don't tell you specifically what one recommendation they would support. They give you some very good choices and choices that would allow us to uh, work together uh, with the county in every single case. So I think it's worth seeing the presentation. Unfortunately, every alternative comes with a price tag. Alderman Klyhunas. Thank you, Chairperson. I, I agree with uh, all that's been stated. I think it's a great report. I was surprised at how advanced their suggestions were in terms of how far down the road they went. And I think it, it does take some time. I think, again, that the city would be attuned to this a little bit, uh, some press coverage on it, uh, things like that. I think that would all help people to be more informed, more interested. And we're building a police station. The police station has a role to play in this. And uh, I think we've got to have it kind of clear as to how, what role it will play in the future dispatch decisions. So okay, I think it's great. Thank you. And seeing that the chairperson of the County Shared Services, Alderman Verhasselt, is not here this evening, I'm sure he would have a lot of information to share with us. So I agree that we, we should probably hold this issue. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Moving on to item number eight, RC number 399-0708 by finance, council number 2052. Your committee to whom was referred RO number 4260607 by the city clerk submitting a communication from older person born attach, attaching an article regarding taxes are high, stating that the property taxes in Wisconsin are the nation's highest in proportion to the value of owner-occupied homes. According to a national study, recommends that the report of officer be referred to the committee of the whole of the new Common Council. Uh, Mr. Bourne, uh, Alderman Bourne, would you have some further information on this? Uh, I would make a motion to file the document, but under discussion, I would like to cover a couple of things in the article. I'd okay. make a second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to file under discussion. Alderman Bourne. Thank you. Uh, originally, I forwarded this article to the finance department of last year's council, and uh, it kind of piqued our interest in finance, so that's why I thought I would ask for a referral to committee of the whole. Uh, just to quote a couple things in the article, property taxes in Wisconsin are the nation's highest in proportion to the value of owner-occupied homes. Uh, using data from the United States Census Bureau, the Tax Foundation based in Washington, D.C. found that in 2005, median property taxes on owner-occupied owner homes in Wisconsin were $2,777, or 1.82% of the median value of such property, the highest such proportion in the nation. The taxes were 4.79% of the median income for, home, for homeowners, number five number five nationally, the foundation found. Uh, what's driving the high property taxes in Wisconsin uh, is covered on the other side. And the two things that are driving property taxes, representatives of local government say that property taxes on homeowners are high for two reasons. Little flexibility on their part to raise money from other sources and the amount of tax exempt property. Wisconsin is woefully pathetic in terms of offering local government tax or fee options to lower local property tax, according to Ed Huck from the Wisconsin Alliances of Cities. Huck said one way to deal with this would be to allow local governments to impose fees to pay for services. Not only would that provide another source of revenue, it would also cover properties that are now exempt uh, are now exempt from tax, such as nonprofit organizations and many business properties. Back when we had the stormwater fee, one of the reasons that I personally and reluctantly uh, supported the stormwater fee, I wasn't on the council at the time, but I let my alderman know I supported it, was because this was a way to get the nonprofits, i.e., the hospitals, the YMCA, and a number of the other nonprofits, and unfortunately included those were the churches, but at least it gave us an opportunity for revenue that now that the stormwater fee is being phased out, 
we are no longer going to be able to get that revenue. Over the years, special interests get or retain tax exemptions. Often those exemptions are broadened after passage. Uh, and a recent court decision about taxation of pollution control equipment that re re may remove millions of dollars of industrial property from the tax rolls. Taxes not raised from that property are paid by others, including homeowners. So again, not being able to raise fees from some of these, these tax exempts is one of, the, one of the huge problems we face. This has been on the plate of the Wisconsin uh, Alliance of Cities for at least five or six years. And of course, it has to happen in Madison where these laws have to be changed. Uh, so I guess you know we have to lobby the people in Madison to make these changes. But I just wanted to bring it to the attention of the taxpayers in Sheboygan why our property taxes are high. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Hanna. Well, thank you. Uh, I shared a, a study today with, with Mayor Perez on, on hospital taxes. Uh, there was a recent study done for the Institute for Wisconsin's Future. And this really confirms what Alderperson Bourne has been saying. 95% uh, of Wisconsin's hospitals are not-for-profit, compared with a national average of 60. Uh, there are 109 tax-exempt hospitals and medical centers in Wisconsin with a total property value of $6 billion. If these hospitals and medical centers were not tax-exempt, local government statewide would have collected an additional $70 million based upon 2005 tax numbers. Keep in mind that the tax exempt status of those entities was back when hospitals primarily served the poor. Things have changed. Thank you. Oh, Alderman Bourne. Just to expand a little bit on what Alderman Hanna was saying, uh, and again, not necessarily pick on the hospitals, but they are multi million dollar corporations. What, what we should be asking the state legislature to do is allow cities like Sheboygan to collect a fee in lieu of taxes for their fire protection, their police protection, and the public work such as a plowing of snow in front of their establishments. We are not asking them to pay the school portion of the property taxes. They would be exempt from that. But at least, and just think of it, for example, if we were getting two or three hundred thousand dollars from our local hospitals. That's a number of police officers that, that we could put on the streets. And right now, in Sheboygan and all, all over the state, cities are not being reimbursed for services that we are providing to these nonprofits. And you know, if, if we could at least get them in the legislature to allow us to collect the fees, it would be a tremendous help to cities throughout the state. Okay, thank you. Seeing no more lights on, we will vote on filing item number eight. All in favor of filing, say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Opposed, motion carries. Moving on to item number nine, RC number 5090607 by the Committee of the Whole, Council Agenda number 2559 by the Committee of the Whole recommending referral of documents submitting a communication from Alderman Bourne with an article entitled, Cities Should Be More Diligent About Financing Tool. Alderman Bourne. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this, this item on the agenda, number nine and also number 11, I would also like to hold for a future Committee of the Whole meeting, not as urgent as the other item we have on hold. The reason for that is, is I talked to Rich Gebhardt, and uh, I wanted Rich Gebhardt and Paul Enders, Paulette Enders to do a presentation on, you might say, the ins and outs of TIF districts. And uh, I asked a couple questions when I had originally sent this article, does Sheboygan have a policy on TIF funding, et cetera. Uh, surprisingly, right now, we do not have a policy on TIF funding, uh, a specific policy. However, Paulette was going to be looking at some other communities around the state and around the country and get back to the Finance Committee. But I w and Paulette, I believe, is out of town or on vacation, so she was not able to be here tonight. So. I, if I would like to hold these documents for a future Committee of the Whole meeting where both Paulette and Mr. Gebhardt could do a little more in-depth uh, informational on TIF districts for the benefit of the Council, I think it would be invaluable. Well, there's a motion and second on the floor to hold 
items number 9 and 11. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Chair votes aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Moving to item number 10, RC number 5520607 by short-term short committee on employee remuneration. Council agenda number 2669. Your committee who met and as per resolution number 2580607 studies the total cost of labor to the city with the cost of labor in the private sector and is submitted in their report. Um, Alderman Manny, would you have some comments on that? Yes, I would. And uh, I'm running the danger of saying too much or too little here. There's much involved. And I will try to summarize as opposed to reading this word for word. If I read it word for word, we're going to be here a long time, although it isn't that extensive. But for the educational purpose, uh, let's see if I can quickly summarize. Uh, about a year ago, this uh, committee was formed, and we got active and directed ourselves to the cost of labor in the city, and comparing that with labor costs in the private sector. The hope was also to have uh, costs not only current, i.e. 2006, but also costs uh, with some historical perspective, perhaps costs five years ago and ten years ago. If we had those uh, studies side by side, we would see clearly trends that would be helpful for us as a council and as a city to see, in fact, where the costs were going and where they've been. We did contract, after much discussion with a private uh, corporation research firm in Waukesha to provide us information from the private sector that we could not uh, secure on our own. There was some cost to that that was authorized in August of 2006. Uh, in working together with uh, people from um, Bemis Manufacturing Company, Sheboygan Falls, their human resource folks, and our human resource people here in the city and on our committee, uh, we came up with 15 job, job categories that would be used for the basis of comparison. Those were categories we deemed most helpful and direct uh, in the comparison efforts. Uh, I won't give you the, those exact positions. I don't think that detail is, is information which uh, city residents watching will, will remember anyway. Um, in that comparison, we had to uh, do a little bit of finesse work because, in fact, we have exact data for city employees. Their length of tenure, their salaries, as well as their job classifications. The information that came to us from MRA about the private sector did not give exact tenure of positions because they were working with, with many companies and many employees. And so they simply gave us percentiles, 25th, 50th, and 75th. They gave us also uh, information relating to the size of corporations, five to 900 employees, geographical location, North uh, East Central is that which we chose to look at, as that reflects our geographical status. And so those were the categories of comparison then that we chose to use as we deemed them most, uh, most adequate in attempting to get some sort of uh, clear picture on costs uh, in relationship to the private sector. With that work in hand and with other data that we, we tapped in the area of uh, benefit costs from the National um, Labor uh, Bureau, I forget the exact name at this point. I can get it for you if you want it. Uh, these were the conclusions that we came up with. And I'm uh, simply going to give you some detail in fact and then um, some more summary kind of conclusions. We found that those uh, in the city that were paid a salary that is less than that in the private sector included the auditor analyst, about 9.6% less, the accountant, about 5.3% less, programmer analyst one, about 3.2% less, superintendent of buildings, electric, and vehicle maintenance, about 16.7% less, and information systems manager, 
about 5.5% less. Uh, the electricians we deemed were paid on the par with the salaries that electricians are being paid in the private sector. Then the following uh, categories were positions we deemed that are paid more than the, the salaries paid in the private sector. Uh, janitor, municipal service building, 18.7% higher. Clerk typist, wastewater treatment plant, 5.6% higher. Maintenance person, crafts and buildings, craftsman and buildings, 7% higher. Park caretaker, 2, 10% higher. Administrative assistant to the mayor, 9.2% higher. The department secretary for the police, 25% higher. The secretary for finance and purchasing, 22.7% higher. One position we deemed uh, we would not be well able to make a conclusion because of particularities in relationship to uh, privacy concerns, and that was the office supervisor for the police department. Uh, we qualify those uh, analyses and comparisons, noting that we're dealing with concrete particulars in the city versus categories and percentages in the private sector. So we deem our conclusions accurate in their direction, but we suggest that we want to uh, claim a 5% margin of error as a realistic kind of picture surrounding our comparisons. Uh, we found further that in relationship to uh, costs with health care and such that in the city we have those costs exactly in hand. And the health care costs for dental, health care, and drug costs constitute 26.5% of the employee's compensation. Whereas in the private sector, um, those same categories of costs for health care, dental, and drug costs total 15% of private sector employees' salaries. Further, it's important to note that in comparison uh, of the benefit categories, city employees in 2006 paid either 2.5 or 5% of their basic health care costs, depending upon which bargaining group they are a part of, uh, noting we had no hard data from the private sector to use in comparison. We do note that city costs for benefits now total 51% of employee salaries. Helpful comparisons are that such costs for the county reach now 53%, and by way of city comparison, the costs in the city of Manitowoc for employee health care uh, benefits, total benefit costs, are 40, no, I'm sorry, 54%. According to the United States Department of Labor Bureau and Labor Statistics, the cost of benefits in the private sector totaled 29.3% of total employee compensation. That's September 2006 data, report released 12-1306. Uh, we note that that data does not note any regional variances, nor does it note a distinction between companies which pay medical benefits and those which do not. Thus, in conclusion, uh, noting these conclusions from 2006 data, that one of 14 job, job categories in the city is paid a salary which is commensurate with that paid in the private sector. This is 7.1% of job categories evaluated. Two, the one job category in the city that seems to be paid a salary above that paid in the private sector but about which we are unwilling to make a conclusion uh, is the same percentage, one of um, 15 categories, thus 7.1%. Uh, uh, 14, 7.1%. Seven of 14 job categories in this city are paid a salary which is higher than that paid for comparable private sector jobs. This is 50% of the categories evaluated. In five of 14 job categories in the city are paid a salary which is less than that in the private sector, 35.7% of the job classifications. 
That's basically it. I do note that the statistics that we worked with were basically averages of those uh, statistics from both the companies of 500 and 900 employees and those in the East Central region. One member of our committee would have preferred using just East Central stats. I laid those out for him also, and there was very little variation. But his preference would have been to use that, and that person is Dick Seideman, who worked for the state in uh, human resources and, and job categories and classifications for many years. So that is the report. Um, the key differences are obviously the cost of benefits, city versus private. And uh, the note that uh, there is a greater number of city uh, jobs that are uh, higher paid in the lower classifications. And that our higher paid personnel, by and large, are more on a par or sometimes below the salaries paid in the private sector. Discussion? Thank you, Alderman Manny. And with that, I would entertain a motion to accept and file. So moved. Second. I need a motion. <laughs> okay. We have a motion and a second to accept and file. Under discussion, Alderman Balk. Uh, just a, thank you, Madam Chair. A uh, quick question for Alderman Manny. Uh, it sounds like it wasn't possible to do a comparison of both salary and benefits. Uh, was that not b because of the, the way it was constructed? Because I worry that some people might say, oh, I'm, getting, you know, I'm not getting a good deal on my salary. But when you take the package as a total, that it might be more favorable. Was that not possible? It wasn't possible because, uh, possible because we had no, had no hard data to deal with in the benefit area. The reason being, as you know, uh, benefits are so diverse in the way they're offered that to interpret all of that minutia uh, leads to highly, highly uh, uncertain conclusions. We did take from MRA the simple percentage that 15% of uh, those basic health care costs, uh, health, dental, those three that I said. Uh, okay. The, that's, that's the differential to the city. That's the important one to know. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Alderman Ryan. Yeah, I'd like to uh, commend Alderman Manny and his uh, committee. Those are some, some real numbers that we're dealing with there. And I'm sure there's a lot of work that went into it. Um, I. I as Alderman Bouk said, uh, the benefit package, I think, for city employees is uh, a big part of, of their total compensation. And, and that should be noted, uh, even though their, their salaries may be on par, their benefit package far exceeds that of the private sector. But it's a good job. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Gisha. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I also express uh, thanks uh, for this report. Uh, I think I differ slightly with Alderman Ryan on the interpretation um, of everything being kind of on par. 50% uh, of our salaries are higher than the, the private sector currently with the city. 50%, if I understand your data correctly. Compounding that, that in itself may be okay if you had a company or a popcorn stand or whatever it happened to be that 50% of your people are higher and 50% are lower, okay. But when a full 51% of city salaries are benefits as compared to 29.3% in the private sector, it makes that whole, everything's kind of equal when it all washes out, really go right to Cleveland because you are in deep yogurt with 51% of salaries compared to 29% of salaries. Deep, because guess what rises faster than those pay numbers? Cost of health care. So uh, I commend those numbers, and I hope it's a report that doesn't end up collecting dust someplace, because that's, that's real-life data and real, real dollars attached to those percentages. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Clayhunas. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, that's my thing is what's going to happen with this report. Uh, this is a great work and a lot of work in it. Uh, are we passing it along to salary and grievance? Where is it going? I mean, I think maybe that's, you know, we moved the file and then it's in the record, but it's nowhere. Um, is, that, is there any suggestion as to what to do with the report? Alderman Hanna. Well, I certainly know that the insurance committee is taking it to heart. Okay. And we are 
talking to several people, realizing that the benefit package uh, is is clearly a high expense item, and we're hoping that it's an area that we can perhaps save money going down the road. It's it's clearly where we want to invest our time and energy because it is such a big component, okay. and, and all the person Manny's report was was excellent in directing us that way. Okay. Alderman Ryan. Yes, I'd like to thank uh, Alderman Gisha for providing me with some new substitute language that now I can use, uh, being, being the word yogurt. Alderman Montemayor. Uh, thank you, Chairman Meyer. I just wanted to say it again. For if every $50,000 salary or wage that we pay, that the citizens of, who live in the city limits of Sheboygan, for every $50,000 wage or salary, it costs the taxpayer over $75,000. Thank you. Alderman Manny. Thank you. I just want to make one comment to uh, soften uh, the comparison that Alderman Gisha made there for a moment. Don't latch on to 29 point whatever percentage that is as an exact number, even though it comes from the, the nation and Labor Bureau, because that includes companies that pay no benefits. In some, some, in some measure, it needs to be upward for a real life comparison to those people who are working for private um, corporations that provide benefits. So just to keep that in mind, it's not a hard and fast number, it's a trend. Significant as the difference is. Thank you. Alderman Wangaman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I too wanted to thank Alderman Manny. There's a lot of numbers here to digest. I think there's even enough numbers here to satisfy Alderman Bauk. <laughs> and uh, I do hope there's a lot of a detail there. He's, he's far better at these, managing these numbers than I am. I let my wife handle the checkbook because uh, I have trouble adding two and two. But I can see there's a tremendous amount of work to be, uh, that was done here, and I, I hope that uh, this document is looked at and used as a guidepost for us in the future. Because I think there's, uh, I do hear it from the people out on the streets too. They, they wonder about the seemingly uh, large benefit package our employees get. But uh, these are all things that need to be looked at over the long run. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Heidemann. Yes, uh, I do want to thank you for your work, Alderman Manning. Uh, again, um, the importance of this document, just to file and not use, doesn't make any sense. That why would we put so much time and effort into that work to let it just go away? Um, uh, there's got to be some other place that we can possibly use this document, I mean, and, and keep it alive so that people don't, our constituents don't think that, well, they did all this work, but now they're not thinking about it anymore. Thank you. And I, I believe that Alderman Hanna covered that, that this is not just going to be thrown in the trash. They are definitely using this as a guideline for their committee. Okay. Alderman Vanderweel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just in case there's any confusion, there's been a lot of talk about file and trash. The motion was to accept and accept. adopt. Thank you. Alderman Manny. Thank you. One last comment. Um, this will be in uh, Ed Sirk's hands in salary and grievance, and uh, certainly a resource for him as ongoing salary negotiations occur. Uh, also, uh, I would intend that we use this as one of the bases through which, by resolution, to approach Senator Lipham and our representatives and ask them to use this kind of data as they discuss state guidelines and law in relationship to uh, mediation and arbitration between uh, municipalities and unions. Currently, state law is stacked against cities because it's simply based on comparables in the public sector. It has nothing to do with any economic issues going on in the private sector. Until that equation and that discussion is broader, and includes more economic uh, issues in the broader societal context, I think the law is, is disruptive of, of city governments and uh, does not then serve the public good. So before long, I'll be bringing a document to uh, council to that end. 
Thank you, and I too thank you, Alderman Manny, for all your hard work, and I know you do excellent work. So with that, we have a motion to accept and adopt. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Chair votes aye. Opposed? Motion carries. And we are down to number 12. There's a motion and a second to adjourn. Under discussion? See none. All in favor say aye. aye. Chair votes aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you all for coming tonight.